Hello and welcome to Veterinary Journal Club, a special edition of Vet Book. That's not really a special edition, it's just the sixth edition or sixth episode where we do chapter five. Chapter five. Chapter five of um, Small Animal Critical Care Medicine by Silverstein and Hopper. Chapter five is about shock. <gasps> shock. Ah, um, not that kind of shock. Medical shock. Do you know what medical shock is? Um, it's when something is dying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's actually true. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. Like, So it's like the blood flow is not going Usually. Well? Yeah. Okay. So the definition um, of shock is usually pretty, pretty widely accepted as inadequate cellular energy production. Like the cells cannot like produce what they need. They don't have, usually because they don't have the stuff they need to do that. There's a few exceptions to that, but it's generally like the cells are not, and usually the stuff they need, it gets delivered by the perfusion. And so when perfusion is poor, mm-hmm. shock ensues. Um, and you just, you were like, they're, they're dying. And I, and I thought, can shock be reversed, like true shock be reversed without any inter- intervention? Like if you go into shock and you receive no medical care, could you survive that? And I feel I'm, like you do in the movies. Yeah, but in real life, I'm trying to IRL. I'm trying for yes, those of you from the nineties. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to decide if it makes sense. Like, could you could you go I mean, I guess you could, because like you could be hemorrhaging, you could be bleeding a, a lot, and you know, you're out in the woods, you trip and fall, and you lacerate an artery in your leg. Ew. Yeah, I know it's bad. And so you lose a bunch of blood, and you so you go into shock from the blood loss, and we can, which we'll talk about a little bit more detail. But you go into shock from the blood loss, and either you know in your your weakened state, but you manage to like you know put pressure on the bleeding, or you know maybe not a tourniquet. And you kind of getting yourself you can, medical attention. Yeah. Okay, fine, fine. All right, no tourniquet, no pressure. You pass out and you're bleeding and then your blood pressure falls and the flow is now low enough that you can form a clot because that's still working. And so your blood clots and then you stop, like the blood loss doesn't continue because you've got a clot now. And then, okay, so you don't, you don't die, but you were in shock, you're in shock, you're in shock. But then, you know, your compensatory mechanisms kick in where you retain water, your kidneys are like, uh, let's hold on to every drop of water we can so you don't make any more urine or very, very little. And That'd be terrible to pass out and pee yourself. <laughs> oh, you can void yourself. That that's gone. But you don't make you don't refill your bladder. So you only you only pee yourself once. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, okay, so you've, you're passed out, um, and then you start stealing fluid from your interstitium and you to try to like improve your blood pressure. And then fortune smiles upon you. <laughs> it hasn't up until now. It starts to rain. And then in the rain, like some of that water <laughs> drips down and you absorb more water. I don't know. This doesn't sound very good. It and sounds then, more likely a deer comes by. <laughs> And it's like, this guy's having trouble. And like, and like stomps on you and does CPR. Gives you a transfusion. Yeah, that would be nice. I, I mean, could you survive without medical intervention long? Like eventually you would have to recover. It's probably recover. Someone's probably done. People are struck like by lightning and they survive. Well, that's not the same as going into shock though. I know, but it's like a bad thing. But like shock is, is like, if you go into shock and you don't, nothing happens. Like it, you don't, it doesn't spontaneously rain into your mouth. Maybe it I'm says pretty it sure you're going to die. You didn't read. Did you read it? No, I didn't know we were doing it like a couple minutes ago. <laughs> this was kind of a last minute. Hey, let's long. do the podcast. We haven't um, done it in a while. Uh, I have not read this chapter in, in maybe ever. What? Well, this wasn't the version of the textbook that existed when I was studying for boards. Yeah. Did they have books back then? Yes. But Just they were all scrolls. paper books. They were all, they were all paper books. <laughs> um, in the Library of Alexandria. So, so, yeah. So it's it's actually possible that I have not read this chapter but i would have read the shock chapter in the previous edition and so if you're really interested those of you listening and you want to see how different one chapter is to the next and how ill prepared or not i was for this podcast you can go back i still think you know um 
I don't know. I'd be curious to know if anybody listening has thoughts on whether or not you can go into shock, get no medical intervention. We're going to just say medical intervention, divine intervention, like if it rains into your mouth is acceptable, Mm -hmm. Um, but no medical intervention and you could survive shock. Yeah. I'm struggling. If you truly go into shock. I guess if a fox came and like sat on your wound, that would. Yeah. Yeah. Like something. But again, you have to go into shock. It's the reversing. So like I can, I can create a ridiculous scenario where um, the cause of the shock spontaneously like solves itself. But like, how do you, you still have to reverse the shock. The reason you got that bad in the first place, like that needs to be fixed. So, okay. Well, maybe, maybe some other ideas will come as we talk about what shock is. Maybe figure in the chapter as you flip through. The, a figure? I don't know. Oh, yeah. Here's some steps. Like, if you ever go into shock, how to, to stop it. No, no that's, that's just not words. a thing. That's not a thing. There's not, like, I literally turned to a page with no figures whatsoever. It's all words. Um, so, yeah, oh, that, no, was, was, all that words. was a there lie. No figures. That was a lie. <laughs> There's one table. There's one table. Okay, so shock just means that your cells don't have the stuff they need to do Why their is it jobs. called shock? That is a really, it doesn't, that's actually a really good it's not question. Like a um, scare thing. It's not no, related to electricity. But it is it is kind of one of those things. So um I think the earliest definitions of shock, I don't think they talk about oh, this. This is your thing. You always know the meaning of all the stuff. <laughs> and you yeah. don't know this one. Not for sure. Um, but I'm pretty sure like the earliest definitions of shock when they didn't understand what was happening at the cellular level um was following trauma. Um so like traumatic injuries and things like that where people um they kind of either like mentally like sort of passed out or yeah. like their body sort of froze up that's how it always and, is in the like, movies tremored it's and like, things like that you're usually covered in a blanket sitting in the back of the ambulance they're like you're in shock <laughs> that's how i know um, shock. you're in shock yeah um yeah so we can talk about what the blanket is for um so most of the time in shock, it does come down to a problem of blood flow of perfusion to the tissues. Um, not always. Um, but this is where it gets a little interesting. So I think I don't, we've probably talked about this on the podcast before, but as human beings, we really like to categorize things. Um, and that's just how we sort of understand things better. And shock is no different. So we're like, well, we need to have different categories of shock to explain the different circumstances that lead to shock. Um, but the, yeah, the common theme is the cells aren't getting what they need. Um, and usually that's because um, we don't have enough blood flow. So then we say, okay, well, what are the different types of causes of shock and the categories of shock? Um, and that will help us just kind of understand it in our heads. And then it will help us, you know, figure out how to treat shock and when, how to recognize it, how to treat it, all those things. Um, the problem with these categories is that we, the grand we, capital W, we cannot collectively agree on what categories to use. Um, and the funny thing is the categories they use in this chapter are not the ones that I teach. Ooh. Well, some of them are. They're, they're, it's not entirely the ones. And so I think it just depends on like how your brain works and how you like to categorize things. And so I don't think it's a problem that we have multiple ways to categorize shock. Um, I think what's important for like, a clinician is to find the system that makes sense to them because then you'll remember it. And then if you remember it, it's mm-hmm. useful. Right. Like it needs to be clean, in my opinion, it needs to be clinically useful to be like, okay, I'm going to categorize it like this because um, this, these group of causes of shock go together for reasons X, Y, and Z. And then I remember how to treat them or recognize them or whatever appropriately. Yeah. Case by so. case, the clinic's not like a math problem. Right. Where they go and it's right. like, uh, you got the right answer, but you didn't do it right. It's like, you saved the patient, but you didn't do it right. So now the it's patient's like, dead. Right. Like, no, you, you, as long as you do the right things, like, and the, the outcome is good. I don't care what name you gave it. Like, I don't actually care how you categorized yeah, it. And the client doesn't care as long as they're. They're like, uh, yeah, I was reading the paperwork that you gave me and I noticed the category of shock you chose is not in line with what I was reading about. I was like, (laughs) I'm sorry. Are you upset that I saved your dog's life? I'm very confused now. So yeah, the the categories themselves and how you do it, I don't think is as important as find a system that makes sense to you. And so um, I will review the, the categories that are in the chapter here. And then I'll also share the categories that I use. And these are not the only two options available. Um, But know that if you're like, I don't like any of those, Google it. And you can find like in a matter of minutes, you can find at least five or six different um, 
groups of categories. So you might be like, I want the fewest number of categories. Do you have or- students get this book for your class? No. Okay, cool. I was going to be like, that would be really confusing for them. They go to no. the test. Uh, Dr. It's Connor, like an optional reading. Like I don't have a book for the classes I teach. I usually just have like my notes and things like that. And then I say, here are some references. Yeah. Um, but um, if I do give them like a specific chapter or an article, if there's anything different, I will point out like, here's how I do it differently. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think it's good for people for people to know like, hey, there's a different way of looking at this that is also correct. Um, because if I teach it a certain way and somebody's like, I just, I really struggle me- remembering that. Like that just doesn't make sense. Cool. It's probably because your brain works differently than mine and other people's, other really smart people also work differently than mine and find something that works for you. So anyway, so, oh, we didn't actually say the authors. So Armel De La Fourcade and um, Deb Silverstein are the um, authors of this chapter. Um, you may recognize Deb Silverstein from the front cover of the book. She's what? one of the editors. Yeah. Um, so Armel and Deb wrote this very, very important chapter. And I'm, I'm curious now, actually, I wonder if this is like the, um, I might have to ask them, um, is this the, the system that they both use? Or I wonder if they were using different ones and they had to compromise? Um, or this is the right one and I'm wrong when I, (laughs) I don't think that's true. I, I, again, a quick Google search and you'll find that there's lots of different ways to categorize shock. Um, you can do one right now. Pause pause the podcast. That's true. (laughs) But you can find legitimate sources like human textbooks, other references, things like that. So without further ado, the, the, uh, classification system they use in, uh, in this book chapter is hypovolemic shock, which they, quickly defined as a decrease in circulating blood volume. I like that one. I use that category. Cardiogenic shock, which they define as a decrease in forward flow from the heart. I like this one, except they have cardiac tamponade included in this one. And I, I don't, I do mine differently. So we'll talk about that later. Um, I, I define cardiogenic shock as pump failure, where this one is just anything causing a decrease in forward flow from the heart. I, if I'm going to call it cardiogenic shock, I'm like, the heart is at fault. The heart is the problem. Mm-hmm. Where this one is not necessarily saying that. And I'll, I'll explain the difference a little bit later. And then they have distributive shock, which I do include distributive shock, but I renamed it to maldistributive shock. Mal meaning bad, poorly distributed shock. I like that better. It's like the blood has been distributed inappropriately. Um, like on the floor. <laughs> no, that would be that would be hypovolemic. hypovolemic. Uh, hemorrhagic shock, which would be a subcategory of hypovolemic. Hypovolemic, hypo meaning low, vol meaning volume, and emic meaning in the blood. Yeah. All right. Just a yeah, Latin review. She doesn't know the filing of shock. Maldistributive shock. Um, which, again, the brief description here is marked decrease or increase in systemic vascular resistance or maldistribution of blood. Oh, they use maldistribution in that. So that's, that's pretty good. So they have sepsis obstruction as one of those, and I have obstructive shock as its own category. Um, And so again, that'll come up in a minute. I feel like sepsis is the thing I hear you say a lot. Yeah, septic shock is a subcategory of maldistributive shock, or for them, just distributive shock. Mm -hmm. It's a subcategory, and we'll talk about that. And then they have metabolic shock, which is not one I usually list out for the students, and then hypoxemic shock, which is also not one that I list out for the students. So, um, so I, I use four categories of shock. Instead so, of five? Yeah, they have, I had to, I had to go back and count. Yeah, they, they have five. I use four. Um, there are others. There's like seven or eight different ones that are out there. People have like traumatic shock, anemic shock, I think is one, hypoglycemic shock. Like they, it gets to be kind of too many. Um, okay, so... Oh, and the last, did I say hypoxemic? So yeah, hypovolemic, that. cardiogenic, distributive, metabolic, and hypoxemic are the five categories that they, um, that they use. And I use hypovolemic, so ding, 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 we're the same there. Cardiogenic, we're almost the same there, but some changes. Our, our definitions are a little bit different. So hypovolemic, cardiogenic, maldistributive, and obstructive shock. And again, they have obstruction as like a subcategory of distributive. But I use obstructive shock as anything that is um, obstructing blood flow to the heart. And so if you're preventing blood flow from getting back to the heart, it's, it's not going to move forward. What if you obstruct blood flow from the heart? That would also, that would also work. So if the okay. heart is working but you're blocking blood from moving through, 
the heart isn't at fault. So I don't call that cardiogenic shock where here they would have called that cardiogenic shock if there was like pericardial effusion, which is I consider pericardial effusion under obstructive shock Mm -hmm. rather than distributive shock. I think that's where they had it. Yeah. So, and the reason for me, I like to group them that way is that I can lump together some of the treatments for them. So with hypovolemic shock, as the name implies, there's not enough volume in the blood. So that could be you've lost whole blood. So like the example of lacerating your artery in the woods and, you know, a fox mm-hmm. comes by. and But before the fox comes by to put pressure on the wound, you lose blood. And so you become hypovolemic from whole blood loss. But you can also um, become hypovolemic not from blood loss, but just from fluid losses, like severe vomiting and diarrhea. Um, severe dehydration can be can get bad enough um, that you just, you have total body water losses um, that exceed your ability to sort of compensate. And so your, your total blood volume is decreased. Um, So again, the, your circulating volume in your, is not enough. And that volume can be not enough cells um, and water or just not enough water, but regardless. Um, So yeah, that's hypovolemic cardiogenic. For me, again, is pump failure. The heart is broken. So either you have um, like a dilated cardiomyopathy in a dog where the heart is not contracting very well and so blood doesn't move forward and the heart is to blame. Or the opposite of that are hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in a cat where the heart is so thick, it can squeeze really hard, but it can't fill. And so the heart is to blame. Or if you have an arrhythmia, um, so the heart is either beating too fast and there's not enough time to fill blood because the heart is beating too fast or it's beating too slow. It's just not enough to generate enough cardiac output or blood flow around. And again, the heart is to blame in those situations. So that's kind of, again, I call it pump failure. And I didn't come up with that. Like that's not a thing I invented. It's just the system that I like and I use. And then distributive or maldistributive, which Mm -hmm. I, I do, I do like that better. Um, that is generally a dramatic shift in um, vascular tone is how that's like how I lump them together. So if you have inappropriate widespread vasodilation, um, so like you can get in sepsis. Um, so normally when you don't have enough blood to go around, your blood vessels constrict down to maintain blood pressure. Um, and so in a situation where you should be constricting your blood vessels, but instead you are dilating your blood vessels, all the blood will pool in the periphery. Um, instead of going to like the heart and the brain where it's supposed to go. And that can happen in sepsis. It can happen in anaphylaxis. So those would be, you have enough blood. You haven't lost blood or fluid. It's just not going, it's going over here instead of over there. Why does it go over there? Is it like a big bruise or? No, that's because again, the the, uh, vasodilation in the blood vessels. What causes that? Um, So it depends. Um, Like an anaphylactic shock, it can be a massive release of histamine and histamine. That's like when you get stung by a bee. Exactly. So when you get stung by a bee and you get like a red spot, locally you have histamine release and that causes a local vasodilation. I don't get a red spot. Well, yeah, you're like magically impervious to bug bites, but you've seen it on me and yeah. I get a big old red spot. And so I have local vasodilation. So blood is pooling, but just in that tiny little area. And that's enough that my body's like, oh, no big deal. But if every one of my blood vessels in like my skin and my muscle suddenly dilated, I now have the same amount of blood, but like increased capacity to hold it. And it all just sits in the, in the uh, periphery. It's all just out in my limbs and in my muscle and my skin. And then it's not going to my heart and my brain. And then my brain and my heart gets sad and I'm in shock. <gasps> um, that's why you don't step on anthills. You try, <laughs> you try not to, it's going to happen one day. I'm just, you're going to, and you're going to know. I don't know why you're dying. Why I'm dying. You won't necessarily know what to do about She's it. It's an anaphylactic shock. Somebody do something. Um, so you're like, I think it's called maldistributive shock. <laughs> the paramedics show up to help me and they're like, she's an anaphylactic shock. Actually, sir, <laughs> I'm going to need, we, we discussed this. Uh, so you call it distributive or I'm, I'm going to need to know how you categorize this shock before I allow you to proceed on saving my wife's life. Um, and then... So yeah, uh, that would be maldistributive shock. So again, blood pooling where it's not really supposed to. And then uh, the last one is obstructive shock. So the classic examples of this is going to be, for me, um, for obstructive shock, pericardial effusion. So there's fluid building up around the heart and the heart itself is okay, 
but that fluid around the heart is, is causing a pressure gradient. And so the blood can't come back to the right side of the heart. And therefore it doesn't get to the lungs and get more oxygen and then go to the left side of the heart where then it can be pumped to the rest of the body. And so you have to relieve that obstruction um, or like a, a GDV, a gastric dilatation and volvulus where the stomach gets so distended and it compresses the caudal vena cava, which is the big vein that is the last kind of like train station stop before the blood gets back to the heart. So same kind of thing. And in both of those, the treatment is relieve the obstruction. Um, so that's why, that's why I like to, I like to categorize them because that's, kind of lumps together the treatments. Mm -hmm. So at any rate, um, the categories are cool. I mean, that's nice. Again, it's a way for you to kind of remember things. So pick a system that works for you. Um, but most of this chapter doesn't actually talk about the categories, which is probably smart, even though we've spent a lot of time talking about it now. <laughs> well, it's not a very long chapter. So. It is actually a really short chapter for like a pretty darn important topic. It's pretty wordy too. There's a lot of, a lot of words yeah, in like it. Yeah, I said not many figures. Yeah, Topher's disappointed. There's not any figures. Um, there should be a drawing of like, I don't know, or, oh no, a photograph of, um, Kevin from home alone. Oh, and the scream. You can have that And the one scream. Too. I thought the first thing I thought of and I was like, ah, that one's a little creepy. Um, but this basically what death. they, what they talk about in this one is like a little bit like of recognizing shock. Um, okay. So you, we've talked about a lot of the things like sick animal things. Like what, what would you guess if you're not getting enough blood flow to the tissues, what do you, how do you think your body would try to compensate? How would it compensate? Yeah. It's like my, your toes, your, 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 your organs are like, I'm not getting enough stuff. And then it's going to like call up to management and be like, Hey, this is ridiculous. So what is management going to do? Management like, oh, we got to do something in the meantime. I guess it could increase your heart rate. Babe. Oh, this is why I love you. 100% the right answer, the most important answer, the best answer you could have given. Yeah. You're so smart. All right, yes. cool. Because I was thinking all the things that would happen. It's like, I would just yeah. think like your- There's not enough blood going around. Your temperature would start going so, down. So, but say that not, again? I think your temperature would start going down, but yes. your body's not doing yes, that. Yes, that is also correct. Yeah. yeah. It's not correct. With the except, There are exceptions. So, it depends on what kind of shock, right? So, in most cases of shock, the first thing your body is going to do is increase the heart the, rate. I guess the one where the-, the Mal distributed one your, would be what your temperature would probably stay. Up. Yeah, it might be increased or it might be normal. Yeah, yeah, because the so blood's smart. all out there. Yeah, you're the smartest person. Yeah, so impressed. Um, and then which type of shock? I know about would you, thermodynamics. Would you, yeah, well, it helps. That's we do some cardiac output monitoring using thermodynamics. Um, so which type of shock would you not expect the heart rate to increase? Necessarily, uh, you might not have the heart rate be increased. I have to remember what they are. <laughs> probably the hypovolemic no that one you would okay. you would i would um, think it's like oh you don't have any fluid so you can't really but that's why your heart's trying to compensate for it yeah. it's like ah we only have a we only have half the fluid so let's pump twice as much to try to get it around it's the cardiogenic shock it depends on the type of shock though most types of cardiogenic shock you're going to be tachycardic but if it's like an arrhythmia like a um what about the something? what's the one where there's like the obstructive one that Wouldn't one, that, usually the heart rate will increase too. But like if it's squeezing the heart? Yeah, it'll try really hard. It just isn't doing a very good job expanding. Okay. That's, that's the problem. The right side of the heart is just like getting squished and squished, but it's trying really hard. Mm -hmm. It's trying really hard. Um, the exception to the heart rate deal is in cats. So sometimes cats will have a low heart rate and shock. They will become bradycardic. Um, is it just because they give up? <laughs> Yeah, kind of. Like, so I have a theory. Whatever. Um, I wonder if they talk about this in here. I know they talk about them having bradycardia, um, but I don't know if they talk about the why. I don't think anybody knows the real why. I've never heard anybody explain the real why. My theory. So cats have two different normal heart rates. <laughs> um, cats have a heart rate that they have at home at rest when they're chilling. Like if we were to grab that one right there, um, hippo, hippo, come here so I can check your heart rate. He's not, he's not coming. I don't, he might respond to you. He's looking at you, but he's like, I don't sense no, there's any food. Anyhow. So he was just napping and we interrupted him. We're rude. So if we were to check his heart rate, um, just before he walked over to you right now, and, uh, it would probably be like 100, 120 beats per minute. Um, but if we were to take him and put him in a carrier and drive him to the vet clinic and have somebody um, check his heart rate then, it's probably going to be 200. I have a different heart rate for all that too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You are very cat-like. So um, cats in the hospital, 
particularly like when they've just arrived at the hospital, have a high heart rate. They're like, this is baloney. I don't want to be here. I uh, like ready at a moment's notice to like sprint out of this place. Um, So we know that they have high heart rates like compared to when they're like relaxed at home in their comfortable environment. Um, So every time a cat comes into the hospital, they're tachycardic. They have a high heart rate. So (laughs) when a cat comes in in shock, they also have a high heart rate or they should. And I can't necessarily use that to distinguish between this cat is a regular cat in the hospital and this cat is a cat in shock. But I think when they start to decompensate, when basically the heart, like you said, they're, they're giving up and the heart is like, I've been, I've been, I've been pumping at this rate for so long and I just can't. And they're about to like, they are about to give up and decline. Then we catch them and they're bradycardic and their heart rate is low. And, uh, and so we have a, an opportunity to treat them then. But I, I, that's what I suspect. I suspect that we're just missing all of the high heart rate cats because they just blend in with all the regular high heart rate cats that come into the hospital. Um, and we see the, the low heart rate when they are no longer able to compensate. That's my theory. I don't really know. They just gas out. Yeah. Yeah. The good news is when they do that, like they, they hang on for a while. Um, whereas like if a dog was had a high heart rate for shock and then its heart rate started to drop, it'd be like, oh, that dog's going to die like right now right now. So I think cats have like a, a slower decompensated shock phase, maybe. I don't know. There's a theory. No, don't write that down. Well, could no, it be because they're smaller? I don't think so. Cause no. like chihuahuas don't, it's, it's like, it's a species thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it may be evolved differently because they're smaller, their size or something else about them, but I don't think so. I can't reason through that in a way that makes sense. Because don't um, oh do do smaller dogs have higher heart rates than bigger dogs, or is it about the same? No, that's such an interesting point though, because a lot of people think that. Yeah, I, I kind of see it as like like so, mouse versus elephant. Yeah, usually a smaller yes. animal has a higher heart rate, but usually if they're of a different species, that right. is generally yeah. true. But dogs like a Chihuahua and a Great Dane are the same species, but. So if you take like what a dog but, is supposed to be, yeah, like a chihuahua is not what a dog's supposed to be. No, but they still have the evolutionary like physiology of regular dogs. It hasn't been that long yeah. since they've um, yeah. separated. So no, um, for a very long time actually, and a lot of people still teach this. So if you were taught this, just know that it's wrong and you can relearn this because um, it, it is incorrect. Do- smaller dogs, small adult dogs have should have the same normal resting heart rate as large adult dogs. So like a Great Dane and a Chihuahua, all other things being equal should have the same resting heart rate. And when I say all other things being equal, I mean like fitness level, like age, health Mm -hmm. status, things like that. Um, But, but if all other things aren't equal and we look at tendencies, um, that's where these like theories come in. So like picture the average, like Chihuahua, Yorkie, small breed dog. And you're usually going to picture like a little nervous dog, like a little like mm, yippee. And like, I get carried around and, um, I'm scared of everything or I'm angry at everything or both. Um, and you picture like the average large breed dog and it's kind of a big doop doo doo loping around, like not super like stressed, maybe gets excited, but not super stressed out dog. And so when they, you take them to the vet, um, <clears throat> the small breed dogs are often, like agitated or excited or anxious, and that will increase their heart rate. Um, Or if you think about fitness level, like the average dog that goes running with his client, you know, his, his owner is maybe not usually the one that you're picturing being carried around in like a fancy purse, you know? Mm -hmm. So if you have like a super fit Chihuahua, like a tech I used to work with um, had a a Chihuahua that she did agility with, (laughs) that dog was pretty awesome, had a super low resting heart rate because he was really fit and he was calm and he was used to coming into the clinic versus like a large breed dog that is not fit at all, um, is a bit of a couch potato, doesn't exercise much and or is like super anxious is going to have a higher heart rate. Um, and there are uh, several studies now that have been published kind of disproving the whole small dogs have a higher heart rate than large dogs. Um, but people, I think it was easy to believe that one because people were seeing those patterns or they thought they were, um, and then understanding basic biology. Exactly. And then understanding that basic concept, but within the same species. And the, the example I often give people is that like little people like Peter Dinklage, if you're a game of Thrones fan, um, the imp, um, he does not have a different rest. Well, he might. He's probably in better shape because he can afford to have like a personal trainer and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. um, so, uh, it, you know, he's going to, he, they don't have a different chart of normal vitals for little people in the hospital. For children, yes. And that's true in animals as well. Pediatrics have different um, like resting heart rates and some other vital parameters. But um, adults 
no. So we kind of got off track there, but that's such an important thing. Um, a couple other things. I'm, I'm not going to go through like every bit of this chapter um, other than to say uh, lactate is probably a really important thing to keep track of um, and to, or to, I guess, understand what it is and when it appears and is why we measure Is that because like once the... Um once it starts kind of getting work through, that means the cells are kind of doing their stuff again. They're getting... What do you mean? So I always hear lactate that they talk about with athletes and they yes. have to get it out of their, yeah. their cells yeah. in order to perform again. So if things are coming out of the cells, things are probably going in the cells. Okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, the, the reason lactate is important is that lactate... Do you know when lactate is produced? Uh, no. So it'll make sense, but like with anaerobic metabolism and usually when you're working out your muscles, there's, there's not enough oxygen to um, power everything your muscles want to do. And so you get into that anaerobic zone and then you produce lactate. Lactate is a byproduct of anaerobic metabolism. So if, um, and, and that's, that's fine during exercise and things like that. That's not a big deal. Um, but if, if it's just your muscles because you're like working out, fine. But if every cell in your body doesn't have enough oxygen and is undergoing anaerobic metabolism, you will get a huge production of lactate because your cells are like, well, I don't want to die. Um, and there's not enough oxygen and this is less efficient, but I'm going to go with this less efficient method rather than just giving up and dying. So your cells keep trying and they produce a bunch of lactate. And, um, but you're right that when lactate starts to clear, that's a sign that your cells are like, oh, cool. Um, my liver is processing this, this lactate. And basically the balance of lactate production and lactate clearance is now favoring getting rid of the lactate because you have converted back to aerobic metabolism. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're not now producing all the lactate so you can get rid of the lactate that had been produced. But the reason I think lactate is so important is that usually when we are looking for um, markers of shock or looking for signs of shock in a patient, we're looking at what um, sometimes gets referred to as like the macro perfusion variables. So things like heart rate, temperature, how do the pulses feel? Um, what is the gum color and the capillary refill time? What's the blood pressure? Um, I can try to measure a blood pressure even if it's not accurate. Oh, we just lost our video again. We're going to have to get new batteries for this. Yeah, it's not the battery. It's just I think uh, maybe it overheats. Giving up. I don't, it's cold outside. Anyway. Um, I'm going to go push the button. Okay. You push the button and then we'll try to take some cute pictures of the kitten. Continue. Um, so that, uh, so you can have something to look at on, if you're watching or listening on YouTube. Um, anyhow, the, um, the lactate, so the macro perfusion parameters are the, all the things we normally think about on a physical exam to be like, Hey, um, you know, we have signs of shock. But um, we have learned collectively, we um, have learned more recently that sometimes those macro perfusion parameters lie and it seems like things are doing better than they are, but at the micro perfusion, meaning at the level of the capillary, so the tiniest, tiniest blood vessels that only allow one red blood cell to go through at a time, that's where perfusion is happening. Mm -hmm. Sometimes what's happening at that level isn't the same as what's happening at the larger vessels. Um, and one of the things we can do to get like practically to get insight on that, like there's some cool fancy, you know, research things that you can do to be like, oh, look at the microperfusion. Um, but clinically, lactate can give us some insight. And so sometimes if we see a persistently high lactate, even if the other parameters um, have improved, like the heart rates improved, the temperatures improved, we might need to be concerned that at the micro perfusion level, at the level of the capillaries, we still have a problem. Um, so lactate is kind of an important um, marker of, um, it, again, it's telling you the result, like your perfusion isn't good enough. It's not perfect because there are other things that will affect lactate besides perfusion, but um, it's a pretty important thing to keep track of. So um, Some other things um, that they talk about as far as monitoring for shock, Um, you know, they talk about things like cardiac output monitoring, which is not something we routinely do in clinical patients because it's not practical How long does a patient stay in shock? Well, like usually not very long, otherwise they die. Because I was thinking you're talking about monitoring it. I wouldn't think that you would need to monitor because I would think it's like, oh, I need to... Stop this. Yes, but you're trying to, you're, so you're going to do your treatments, um, but like, how do you know when to stop treating for shock? And so that's one of the things we're going to monitor. So it is going to be quick, um, or hopefully it's going to be quick, because um, like you're right. Quick, like hours, yes, minutes. Yes, hours. 
Sometimes. I mean, hopefully minutes. If I'm in shock, I'm hoping they get me out of shock in minutes, but <laughs> that's not always feasible. So, um, but it's also like, depending on what the underlying cause is, like we could treat the shock and like improve things. And if we don't fix the underlying problem, they could slip back into shock. So that's the other reason that you might monitor is you're like, okay, cool. We've made some good progress, but I haven't cured their sepsis in 15 minutes. So I might need to keep adjusting and changing as their body responds to whatever the pathogen is or whatever the disease is that's causing the shock. Um, So it can be a dynamic process in that in most cases, it's not like, poof, you're cured. We fixed it. Some cases it is, you know, it's like hemorrhagic shock. um, But the the fox came by, formed the clot. We just need to give you a transfusion and then you're cured. Cool, because the fox already took care of the, you know. Mm -hmm. It was a fox, right? Yeah, fox. <laughs> what other animal um, in the woods would help you like that? Yeah, the fox is going to come back and be like, hey, you owe me. It's time to pay the piper. Yeah. And by piper, I mean the fox. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I feel like, yeah, a lot of the other animals would be a little too scared. A squirrel would probably not. Yeah, it's not even big enough. It's big enough. It's, it would it just was, like throw things would, at you though. But it would also like give you five other lacerations. That's true. A bear might. A bear would just be like, mm, but a fox yeah, might too. Let's be honest. No, the fo- foxes are like clever and helpful. They'll be like, okay, now <laughs> bring me a steak. <laughs> what? <sighs> Got weird. Um, yeah. So of all the things that are um, in this chapter about monitoring of shock, I think lactate's the most important one to know. Um, our monitoring tissue perfusion, oxygen delivery, like just f- physical exam stuff is fine. Monitoring heart rate, I think is really good um, for all sorts of reasons. But um, yeah, they talk about cardiac output monitoring. It's like, mm, you're not going to do that. You're, you're not, not in a shock patient, like during it, like you might do it in research. It's in, it, conceptually, it's good to think about, but you're, you're not going to do it. Not realistically. Um, they talk about mixed venous oxygen saturation and central venous oxygen saturation. You're also not really going to do this. Um, Because you're probably, if, unless they've been like in the hospital and they've already been instrumented with the catheters, but even then you're probably not going to do this because nobody places the um, pulmonary capillary wedge catheters or anything anymore. Um, Most of the chapter appropriately, um, even though it's not very long, is dedicated to treatment of shock. Um, And this, I think, is why the categories are important because, um, and that's why I categorize shock the way I do is because I lump things together based on how they are treated. So hypovolemic shock, give them volume. Um, Cardiogenic shock, fix their heart. It's not always that simple, but you get the idea. Um, Mm -hmm. Obstructive shock, relieve the obstruction. Maldistributive shock, fix the distribution problem. So like if they're vasodilated, give them something to constrict their vessels. Um, And that's like a nice simple like A to B way for me to keep track of things. It is admittedly a somewhat limited categorization system because it doesn't account for every different type of shock, but none of them really do. Um, so I don't feel too bad about that. Um, yeah, I don't know. Is it time to quiz you? I don't know. Well, you gave away what the show was. Oh, I'm what? Uh, so, uh, as we wrap up our conversation on the chapter of shock, it's time for, it's time for, I didn't know it was a secret. Oh, I gotta turn the sound up. That will help. What's it time for? Does this mean you have to answer in the form of a question? It's a quiz show, <laughs> but not for Bobby. Bum, bum, bum. It's a reverse quiz show. Reverse quiz show. So she's going to ask me questions because I didn't know that we were doing this and I didn't have time to make any questions. So now we get to find out that while we're doing the podcast, whether or not Topher actually listens to the things I'm saying. Or, or if he I'm just, just looking at the cats or playing with or the cats. Or he's playing with the cats or he's just like thinking about like something I said the other day and I'm just going to throw out some random question. So, <clears throat> all right, we're going to start with some simple ones. Well, wow. This is the longest one we've done, so I feel a little a little gypped. Good. No, this is good. This is good. This is going to be perfect. There's a lot of hard words. So, oh, is it just going to be like a spelling test? No. Oh. That's so, a different sound. for the chapter in this book on shock, how many different categories of shock do they use? They used five. Can you name them? You're giving yourself points. Come on. No, I was trying to. Okay. Oh. The, the. Can you name them? They do. The chapter. Name the chapter? What categories do they use in the chapter? You they on? do um, hypovolemic. Yes. 
They do, um, what was the second one? They do distributive. Yes. They do, don't do that. <laughs> so they, yeah, they trying like to give him a hint. Hypoxic. Yes. That's three. They do, uh, what was the other one you don't like? Because you're weird. <laughs> this one, that's a tough one to remember. What were the other two? Okay, so there was there was like there was a <laughs> cardio one, cardiogenic four. You can get credit for that one. And last one, I'll be impressed if you get this one. The last one was what was it related to? It was related. I don't even. I didn't really talk much about this one. So if the blood sugar is low, um, I I didn't spend a lot of. I spent yeah, the least I don't amount of time. Last one. It was metabolic shock. Metabolic shock. Ah, right. I should have known that. Why? Why would you know? You said it. Oh, okay. I mean, I barely said it. Okay. How many categories do I like to use? You have four. And which four categories do I like to use? You use the the cardiac. Cardiogenic. Hypovolemic. Hypovolemic. Maldistributive. Woo, maldistributive. And? And then the last one that we just talked about. Um, Think about the treatment for it. Oh, it's the... It's when like the heart's getting squeezed and stuff. Obstructive. Obstructive. Nice job, babe. Good job. Um, I'm impressed. That was pretty good. Yeah, was, you just said those. It's easy. I know, but still. The kitten knows. And these ones you got like without even discussing it. So um, what would be the expected findings on a physical exam of a dog with shock? Oh. Um, In most, most types of shock. Most types. It would have a high heart rate. Yep. Uh, a low... Body temperature. Yep. It would have high lactate. Yes. I wasn't even going that. It's not physical exam, but yes. And then its gums, I don't, its gums would be pale. Yeah. Because in most types of shock, they're vasoconstricted to try to keep blood to the heart and the brain. Is there Which type of shock would you not see pale gums? Oh, the, the mal- maldistributive? Yeah. Yeah. They might look bright yeah. red or, yeah. Good job. And when does lactate form? Lactate forms during anaerobic stuff. So like when the cells run out of oxygen. Yeah. So it's a byproduct of anaerobic metabolism. Burning themselves. Yes. They burn themselves. And last question. Can, if you don't get any medical treatment at all, can you survive shock? (laughs) Only with the help. From a fox. Of your woodland creature friends. <laughs> oh, and rain falling into your mouth. And you need divine intervention with rain to fall into your mouth while you're passed out, but you swallow it. You don't aspirate. You don't drown. You have mm-hmm. to swallow it. Um, good job, babe. Yay. That was good. Um, yeah, that you made it hard to ask questions because you got a lot of them right during the show. Just because you're okay. smart. Smart. You also listen to me a lot, so like, yeah, I, I have to listen to you. It's, I learn by you osmosis. Have, you get to listen to me because you get called <laughs> in the middle of the night. That's and true. I have no choice but to stay there and listen. It's true. I should have you just take my own call. You could probably. There was one of the vets that interviewed at Florida that said her husband. <laughs> what? Like, no, I don't the, remember that. The when was this? The lady from Missouri. Oh, I don't remember this at all. Yeah, I That's think her hilarious. husband was like the uh, the announcer for the Missouri basketball team. He's a weatherman. Who thing. is this? I don't remember any of this. You remember this? No. Are you sure I was there? Yeah, it was at Paisano's. Wow. I remember 0% of this conversation. And this is why I got all the questions right. This it well, almost all. You didn't almost. you missed the fifth one. Womp, womp, womp. <laughs> okay. Um we didn't cover everything in shock as that's a huge topic, but I think there'll probably um, be other chapters about it. We had some fun and I'm sure some some of these important concepts will come up um at a later date. But uh oh, I think that signal means again. that yeah, it's time to end the show. And what's the next um, chapter? And then the next chapter will be chapter six on systemic inflammatory response syndrome or sirs sirs yes not madams sirs <laughs> all right we'll catch you guys next time bye uh, oh i'm one can't wave to the camera it's off you can wave to it it just won't be recorded i wave too <laughs> bye, bye.